Welcome back to the Ground and Simplicity Podcast. This is Bonnie from The Not So Modern Housewife, and I am joined by my good friend Danielle from The Rustic Elk. And today we are talking about saving money in the kitchen, which I know is uh, forefront on everyone's minds with the rising cost of food and everything in general. <laughs> so, with that happy thought in mind, how on earth do we spend less money? I don't think it's so much that you're spending less money. I think I think you're going to spend more than what you're used to, but you can certainly conserve some of it. Is probably yeah. a better way to put it. Because, yeah, it could be. You know, like even if you're eating the same way and you were already frugal in the kitchen, you're probably spending more, you know, with better, more frugal eating habits than you were spending because everything went up. Well, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I will say... It has changed what we buy and like the way we eat um, because, you know, I like to try things from different cuisines and get special ingredients and maybe some more exotic stuff. And I really can't afford to do that right now. <laughs> um, and so we're, you know, we're going with the cheapest cuts of meat and kind of just going back to. I don't know. I guess more of the foods that I was raised on. I was going to say that, 1980s foods. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing, you know, hamburger helper, but um, I mean, am I the only family that like, it seems like almost all of our meals were either hamburger helper or tuna helper. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing Kool-Aid. <laughs> My kids can drink regular water with all, all of the sugar and stuff in it. Um, or, you know, we do like juice concentrate, frozen juice concentrate. But anyway, yeah, it's, we're doing two noodle casserole. I'm just, you know, doing the from scratch version and from scratch macaroni and cheese. Um, I'm really like not doing very many cheeseburgers because that's so much hamburger. I like. Right, right. Um, so yeah, just, you know, seeing how far we can really like stretch the meat and stretch our food budget and. Um, making casseroles that you know can feed us for a couple of meals things like that yeah we uh had foregone the uh, costco membership for the last several years and decided to go back to costco even though it's super far because it's so much cheaper than and for a lot of things not everything i always try to like price check to mm -hmm. make sure that i'm actually getting a good deal on something at Costco versus, you know, getting it the regular grocery. But right. Um, since we spent a lot of time in Fort Wayne anyways, we went ahead and got the membership back and buy a lot of that stuff in bulk, which helps. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess, uh, I don't know. I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole of saying what we do before we get start getting into our point. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to just go ahead and start with point number one. What or so? What are some of the things that we can do to save money on groceries? Oh, point number one is bulk buying. So yeah, yay. Um, yeah, I need to get into doing more of this. Um, be I mean, we there's some things that we buy larger quantities of, um, but one of my strategies for. Uh, for saving money is going to be getting back to making more stuff myself. And so there's certain things, especially grains, um, flour, rice, oatmeal, that we could certainly be buying in larger quantities to, to use in more recipes. We use, um, like we bought uh, carrots, carrot, you buy six pounds of carrots at Costco. They're like three bucks here. Nice. And then I, I take them and freeze them or can them. We do the same things with potatoes um, buy a big 15 pound bag at $7 at Costco. And then you can, you know, queue them up and can them or mm -hmm. make them into French fries and freeze them or, you know, whatever. Um, same thing with like green beans. We buy fresh green beans and almost all their produce is organic. So we just buy a bunch of produce mostly. And then I bring it home and can it, freeze it, turn it into something you know, so that it doesn't go to waste and we don't have to use it, you know, all right up front. But since our garden's not really productive yet and we ran out of carrots, I bought a bunch of carrots. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
Yeah, I'm like, I'm I'm just now reclaiming my garden from um, my eye infection last year, and so I've got stuff growing, but nothing's really producing yet. Um, I do have a decent sized green pepper out there, but I need to support the plant somehow because the the green pepper is so heavy on this little pepper plant that it's like touching the ground. Get you a little uh, like thin bamboo sticks or dowel rods or whatever and yeah. buy some of those clips like I've got my tomatoes on that's how we clipped our peppers to keep them yeah upright. I've got I've got bamboo um po poles and then I have the velcro that you can cut a little strip and then velcro yeah so I think I'm gonna do that I've got a couple of that velcro um but anyway yeah one thing I've thought about too is getting like a big thing a big thing <laughs> I think you've been in the South too long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My Southern Ohio is showing. Um, <laughs> anyway, but getting a big thing of dried beans and canning the dried beans. Yeah, we do that too. Um, because yeah, like we use, we use a lot of black beans, um, but also kidney beans for like chili and stuff like that. And um, well, we'll talk about like stretching meals here in a minute, but um, I found that like adding beans in is a really good way to stretch a meal and get more protein in instead of having to um, do as much meat. So, except it's way too hot for chili. It's never too hot for chili. It is too hot for chili. We did not do chili in the summer here. <laughs> we were drinking hot chocolate last night. So I don't oh know my! <laughs> Anya got the hot chocolate out today. She's like, or no, she pulled a mug out and she's like, "When are we going to have this again?" And I'm like. When it's below zero, not 100 degrees outside. <laughs> I mean, I drink hot coffee okay. year round, so I guess I. Well, yeah, yeah, I drink hot coffee year round, but uh, we don't do that. I just don't really. Yeah. We occasionally will have like a bowl of soup or something in the summer, but it's just it heats the kitchen up too much, and it's just not. Yeah, um... it's more of a cool, cool weather type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe if I did it in the crock pot, it wouldn't be quite so bad. Yeah. Um, I do that, but, but like I, I said, just it's like, still I just like the flavor, you know. Yeah. But I don't I don't know. I like to come in from a cold winter's day and warm up with a bowl of soup. I do not like yeah. to come in from a hundred degree day and have a hot bowl of soup. <laughs> Honestly, if I've been outside working in the garden, I just I don't eat. I just come inside and like chug water and take a nap. <laughs> yeah. Just like I've been trying to think of meals for this surgery and I'm like some a bunch of people are like soup and I'm like it's too hot for that I'm not making yeah. soup I um ever since I had mono in high school and I was on a strict diet of soup for a month and a half um I'm not a real big soup drink eater yeah I mean I'll, <laughs> I'll 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 make it but all of my soups end up being more like a stew anyway because I add so much other stuff and not enough liquid um but also my kids aren't real big on soup. Like, or they'll waste all the broth. So it's really, it suits us better to have stuff that's a little bit thicker. Yeah, all my soups are pretty much stews too. We do like chicken gnocchi and um, like chicken tortilla soup, which I mm. make thick and chili and potato soup that's never soupy. It's always right. thick. Those are our top soups. And my chicken and noodle is like chicken with noodles and there's not a lot of broth. So. <laughs> Almost like chicken and dumplings. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's our, the big one here is uh, beef and barley soup. And oh yeah. I always, you know, it's like, a, it's a nice soup consistency up until the point that I add the barley and then the barley sucks up like all the liquid. <laughs> so, <laughs> it is what it is. So um, yeah, there are, there are more options than just Costco. Um, Obviously, Sam's Club. I had a Sam's Club membership and really didn't find a whole lot there um, that I wanted to buy. Yeah, uh, it seems either. like, yeah, like they have a lot of, it's a lot of prepackaged name brand stuff. Um, not a real great organic selection. So yeah. um, I'd say, I do remember, it's been a long time since I've had a BJ's membership, but I remember BJ's having a decent organic selection. Yeah, we don't have those here. I have a few friends on the East Coast that have them and they like them, but I mean, yeah. I can't really. 
So it's something you can check out. Um, we had them in Ohio. And, and I mean, we have them here, but the closest one to me is like an hour away. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if we have them here at all. I don't think we do. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think um, it might be further east. Yeah. And then um, in terms of online, Azure Standard is one that I know um, a lot of homesteaders use uh, because like they have a lot of stuff that is organic as well as like bulk grains and, you know, things that people will typically stock up on. Um, and then you found another one that you had mentioned. Yeah, it's called boxed.com. Um, we've looked into it. We haven't actually done anything with it yet, but we considered it. And then we ended up getting a Costco membership. So now I have to try to compare. I know there's no membership fee to use the box thing. And then they deliver it straight to your door. So, yeah, that would be a big incentive for me because with gas at $5 a gallon, I don't really feel like driving anywhere. <laughs> Ever. Ever. I, I can't drive for six weeks. So. <laughs> I need to like get my horse back in shape. I'm going to start riding him to town. There you go. Yeah. I cannot see my horse standing tied in a parking lot for any period of time, but that's another story. Um, anyway. All right. So now next up, are you ready for our um, next point? Yeah. Buying right. direct from the farmer. Yeah. We, we need to look into buying beef. Um, I've been working on clearing out some space in the freezer so that I can get like a quarter of a cow. Um, but like with that big, die off of beef in the wet out west i don't know what that's going to do to beef prices it sounds like auction prices are still decent here but i'm sure it's just a matter of time before it all trickles down we uh bought a whole cow and filled an entire freezer we have deer meat still not a whole lot we've eaten most of it where we both got a deer over the winter um we have our own chickens and ducks and turkeys in the freezer and but we also bought a pig my question to you is bonnie how does one budget for all of this bulk buying because i know our cow was close to four thousand dollars and that was cheap yeah. in comparison to even how much it would cost us now and I mean, that was a whole cow so it'll last us a while right right um i mean i hate to say it most people i know will use their tax refund to do it um if <laughs> i'm sorry Unless you're self-employed and you end up owing the IRS. Um, but I mean, ours, our tax refund didn't go towards that. It should have at least part of it. Um, but I had to pay 10 grand. So. <laughs> so how much money are you setting aside for taxes this year? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> but no, I mean, really like, it's one of those things where like the best time to start saving for it was a year ago. The second best time to start saving for it is now. Um, you right. Start but my question some is, aside. is how do you set some aside when grocery prices are already where they're at and they don't seem to be, you know, slowing off any. So your budget already, I mean, like for us, even without having to buy meat, our grocery budget is close to double. Oh Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's not by me. So, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. kind of hard to figure out the semantics of how you're going to save money when you're spending twice as much already. And, well, you know, everything's going up except your paycheck, right? Right. Well, first of all, at least I like, at least around here, there are ways to buy from the farmer without having to spend a thousand dollars. Um, you know, I mean, especially like when it comes to the produce, we can really buy in whatever oh, yeah. quantity we want. Um, right. When it comes to the meat, even if you can't buy a smaller quantity from the farmer, you can find like a friend or family member who's also looking for some and split whatever you get with them. So you're still getting that like discounted per pound price, but maybe now instead of 300 pounds of meat, you split it with two other people and now you're only paying for a hundred pounds of meat or, or, you know, whatever. Right. Um, I'd say that's probably <laughs> the easiest. Otherwise, maybe you can find some farmers that are just selling, you know, retail cuts. It, it really depends on um, the laws in your state and like the permitting requirements and licensing requirements and stuff like that. Cause I know here in Florida, um, the only way you can buy like 
the individual cuts of meat from the farmer is if they are using a USDA butcher, um, which then your butchering costs are a lot higher. But otherwise, the way around it for a lot of farmers is they will use a custom butcher who is not USDA certified. But what you are doing is you are paying the farmer for the animal. And then you're paying then, the butcher shop for the slaughter. Right. And, and then you are, yep. and then the, the farmer is doing you the convenience of taking your animal to the butcher. Right. And then you are picking up from the butcher and you are paying the butcher directly. Right. So our large animals are pretty much the same here in Indiana. You can't sell individual cuts of meat unless you're going through a USDA certified facility, but um, chicken and rabbit can be sold here. Um, like anybody can, I can sell it here. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Rabbit has to be frozen. Chicken yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I think rabbit still has to go through a USDA processing here, and there's only like one processor in the whole state, and I don't know if they do small quantities. Um, otherwise, there is a special license we can get to sell pol processed poultry. Um, which here is we can we can sell so many chickens per year. I yeah, don't know who well, releases that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even with the limited poultry license, we're limited on how much we can sell per year. Right. Um, and admittedly, like if you're not doing a decent quantity of processed chicken, um, the paying for the permit is kind of cost prohibitive for most people because it's like $125 a year. And you actually have to have a health inspector comes out and you don't have to have like a certified commercial kitchen or anything like that, but they just want to know what your process is and that you like that you've thought through your process and like kind of how you're going to keep everything clean and, and everything. Um, I like think if, it's but if we're selling cost prohibitive to raise small quantities of meat birds anyways, and try to sell them for resale because unless you're charging, you know, like $30 a bird, which most people aren't going to be willing to pay, well, you're not going to be making a lot of money off of them here. They're actually willing to pay it. Um, so I would say you'd be surprised what people are willing to pay for. Um, I'd be super surprised if somebody paid that kind of money here. <laughs> yeah. I mean here, like, well, and again, you know, we have like, we have whole foods and fresh market and like, you know, the, the organic grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you're kind of marketing to those types of people that are, are willing to you know, right. go to, go to Whole Foods and pay that price anyway. Um, and they understand that it is about more than just the cost of the chicken. It is about like, they are supporting their local agriculture. Right. They are getting a bird that was raised humanely and it's kind of like they're voting with their dollars kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I know I get it. Like far. And even in the town that I'm in, um, we're far enough removed from the city that it is still kind of farm country here. And so you get people that are less willing to pay those prices because like they just, they don't see the benefit. Right. But I mean, same thing, like they don't want to pay for eggs either. And then it drives me nuts because we've got people who are, aren't even licensed to be selling eggs. Cause of course here, the same, the same license that allows us to sell processed poultry um, is also what allows us to sell eggs. And so you've got people that don't have the permit but because we're far enough out, we're not really monitored. Right. And so they're selling eggs for $2 a dozen. And really it's like, it's not even paying their feed bill, but yeah, they don't no care. Way. They don't even care about recouping their feed costs. They're just want to get rid of extra eggs. That's how it is here. I mean, we don't have to have a license or anything, but that's what everybody does. They just, and I'm like, so I can buy your eggs cheaper than I can buy them at the store now because now the store is like three nineteen dollars for a dozen here. Right. I'm like, and now I can't sell my eggs for that because I'm not going to give them away. Right. And yeah, it's because yeah. that, yeah, you end up taking a loss if you're actually selling them for that. Not to mention, okay, even if you're making enough money to buy that bag of feed for that week, what about all those months in the year when your birds aren't laying and you're still feeding them? Right. So it's like you're, it's what you're doing is not sustainable, but you don't care because you have another source of income. Whereas if you've got someone who is using this as a source of income, now they're not able to, you know, actually sustain their business. Right. Um, now there's, 
you know, there's marketing that can go into that and, and you end up building up customer loyalty because when you are a sustainable business and people come to know that they can rely on you for eggs and it's not just, you know, on your whim, then you end up, you know, having customers that are willing to pay that. But sometimes it can be an uphill battle. Most of the time it can be an uphill battle. <laughs> so please support your farmers who are actually trying to run self-sufficient businesses. And <laughs> yeah. And don't, you know, I think a lot of times though, it is cheaper to buy from your farmer, especially when you're talking about produce because you're buying it in season. So, right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, yeah, like here. I, um, we have one farm that we buy sweet corn from and they, they only have sweet corn two times a year. They, they plant their fields for like a two or three week window. Um, and then they sell out as like, as soon as the, during that two week window, they will be closed on certain days if they run out of corn and the rest of the corn's not ready to harvest. But then once they've sold everything they have, they're, they're done. They close back up until the next sweet corn season rolls around. Right. Um, so yeah, it stinks that I can't just get sweet corn whenever I want, but there's their corn tastes a whole lot better than stuff from the grocery store because it is just picked and it's fresh and the stuff that is at the grocery store has like been traveling and is half dried out and has no flavor. Um, but also it's like the stuff from the farm is half the price per ear as the grocery store is. Yeah. We didn't add that as a point, but um, eating in season is definitely another. Yeah. Well, and again, like, it's, like it's you a lot kind of said though, season. if you're buying from the farmer, you're kind of forced to buy in season. Right. But I think we become, you know, complacent to the idea that, um, food has seasons, all food, you know, whether it be eggs or me, even meat, um, but especially produce, because, you know, we expect fresh tomatoes on our store shelves, you know, any time of year where it's not really the case and you sacrifice a lot of quality by right. having the, the crummy cardboard tomatoes that don't even have a flavor. Like, I don't even understand why people buy them, but anyways, <laughs> I guess they I mean, have something red on their food because they don't really taste. Yeah. Um, I guess I I usually only buy the, the tomato on the vine. And I don't know why, but it, it, it has at least some flavor. Um, yeah. But I still I still prefer the ones I grow myself. Um, but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've run into the same problem with apples. And the really stinky thing is we can't grow a lot of apples here in Florida. So I'm kind of having to rely on them being imported and getting them from the grocery store. Um, mm -hmm. But like there's certain varieties I just won't buy anymore. Cause I know they're just, they're not going to have any flavor. They're going to be mealy and we're not going to eat them. Right. So I don't know. It's like they've just bred the crap out of them. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for the next one? Yeah, I think so. Stretching meals and meats. Yes. So we've been doing this a lot lately and um, something that a friend of mine pointed out was uh, sh the shrinkage that's going on with prepackaged foods. Shrinkflation. Yeah. Yeah. Shrinkflation. Um, because she was commenting on how she got smoked sausage and, you know, it used to be a one pound, you would get a one pound package of smoked sausage mm -hmm. and now it's like 14 ounces or 12. and it might even, or 12 ounces. Yeah. Like it might even be bacon's the now. same way. Yeah. And, uh, and I made jambalaya this last week and we ran into this problem where, yeah, it was less than a pound of smoked sausage. And so we had to add in extra like diced tomatoes to kind of stretch it a bit. Right. Um, and then like I made spaghetti and typically we'll do a pound of hamburger to a jar of tomato or jar of spaghetti sauce. And instead I decided I did a um, pound of hamburger to two jars of t spaghetti sauce so that we could get a couple of meals out of it. Right. And you can, um, as far as like stretching meats, like <clears throat> you can eat the meat and then you can, you know, pull the leftovers off and make it into a sandwich or a soup because we mm -hmm. all have soup. And then you can uh, also use the bone to make broth for later for a soup or, you know, a base for something else or whatever, or. Yeah. Gravy. Like in culinary school, we would call that rewetting the bones when you take a, a roasted bone or, and then turn around and use it to make a, stu a soup stock. 
Because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, I mean, it it may have slightly less flavor than it would have if you just used it straight. Or you might have to, like, cook it longer to get all the flavor out. Um, but it's still usable that way. Right. And, like, or an example would be you do a roast chicken one night. The next day you pull the meat off the bone and make like chicken salad. And then you turn around and use those bones to make a chicken broth for something else. Um, Mm -hmm. Or you pull that meat off. I mean, honestly, I guess it depends on the size of your bird. But if I pull the meat off of a roast chicken, it ends up being too much meat for just like uh, chicken noodle soup. So I will use some of that meat for one thing, like maybe chicken tacos. And then the rest of it will be chicken noodle soup, something like that. So there's a lot of ways that you can like repurpose your leftovers. I mean, the biggest thing for us is on these individual meals, um, adding in like grains and beans so that the meal is more filling and then we're not having to use as much meat per meal. I would say making casseroles is another good way to do this. Right. Is you can get away with using less meat in the casserole by like adding in potatoes or beans or things like that that can like fill it up and usually that casserole is going to feed you for a couple of days right and you're usually using a cheaper kind of meat to make the casserole too so right yeah so yeah there's um definitely ways you can do it Eh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) we don't do meatless um i'm not into the whole like meatless monday thing but uh, you know that's yeah i mean i like your prerogative if, I'm not saying we never do it, but it's right. not like, something I don't, like we go out of our way to do. Exactly. I don't make a point of doing vegetarian dishes. If I do vegetarian dish, it's just because the recipe looked good. Right. Um, otherwise, like I still feel like the meat gives the, the meal a certain amount of flavor that like I don't get from the grains and beans, things like that. I think it's more filling, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, protein protein and fat you know in general are more filling so like longer term like you're not getting that like empty carb on full right. and then 20 minutes from now i'm after i had my you know fettuccine i'm hungry again type of thing so <laughs> yeah. yeah well yeah and and i like i mean i went i went through that um when i was pregnant i i ate a lot of um like chicken breast or something like that like i would have to have a meat first thing in the morning um, to ke- or otherwise I would end up with nausea throughout the day. Right. So it's like that having that protein, like I couldn't just have, you know, toast or oatmeal or whatever, or a granola bar. Like right. I had to have protein to help keep me satiated and not nauseous. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure there's some science behind it, like regulating blood sugar and stuff like that. Too, there so. is. But we're not going to talk about that. No, I don't like. I don't feel like going into that right now. <laughs> right. Let's talk about menu planning instead. Yay! Um, so I have to give a shout out to this app that I use called Cooklist. And what I like with it is I can put everything in, like everything from my pantry, fridge, freezer, into the app, and it will actually tell me what recipes I can cook just based off the ingredients I already have on hand. So I can save money on my groceries just doing that because a i'm not rebuying ingredients that i already have that i forgot i have um but then also i'm not picking recipes that i'm gonna have to buy all of the ingredients for i'm like already narrowing it down to recipes that i don't need to buy a lot of ingredients for and it helps keep everything rotated in my pantries i use a pen and paper (laughs) So <laughs> there's that. Um, no, no, no fancy apps here. It's just, you know, pen and paper. And I have like a pantry list of what we have. And I kind of have, you know, like a little bit of mental note and I'll look and see if I think that we have something to see if we actually have it. And like last night I uh, made chicken and broccoli and I usually put uh, oyster sauce in it and I didn't have any. So I just omitted it from the recipe. So um, and that was like a spur of the moment type of meal, but I just use a pen and paper and just write down. Usually I'll just kind of like write down meal ideas for a week or two and mm-hmm. then pull from my freezer what I can and from my pantry what I can. And then 
figure out what I need to buy from the grocery. And most of the time it's not much. We went three months without going to the grocery. So, Oh, wow. I have to go every week just to replenish the milk. <laughs> well, I mean, we went and we the sour bought, cream. We, yeah, we bought milk and, um, we bought bread, but I mean, we didn't have to like go grocery shopping. Like I didn't, right. I didn't need produce because I had a bunch of frozen produce and we didn't need meat because we bought all of our meat in bulk or we butchered our own. So we didn't go to the actual grocery store for three months, but I mean, I can't say that we didn't stop at the store at all, but all, you know, it was, you know, like a $10 expense as opposed right. to, you didn't need going to do like a couple a hundred bucks. Line. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and that is one thing with buying in bulk is you can cut down on those trips. Um, I mean, a nice thing, like I've been using Kroger delivery and the minimum for it is $35. Ours is so, too. yeah. So it makes it really nice. Like I don't have to do a big grocery order to be able to get stuff. So like, I don't feel like I need to buy stuff that I don't need. Right. And so if it's, you know, yeah. If it's just milk and a handful of other, you know, pantry items, then all I have to do is meet that $35 and I'm good to go. Which is not hard to do with the price of food the way it is, but uh, yeah. Which brings us to our next point, which is ordering, ordering groceries. groceries. This episode was brought to you by Kitchen Botanicals, your sustainable gardening headquarters. Stop by kitchenbotanicals.com and get a look at our 2022 seed varieties, as well as supplies and pest control products to help you with your organic garden. 2022 is a great time to take care of yourself with our Pampered Gardener subscription box. Every month, you'll receive all natural self-care products, untreated heirloom seeds, high-quality garden tools, organic garden amendments, cute and practical supplies supplies, and fun products that we know you'll love. This is your opportunity to take care of yourself in the garden. I started the Pampered Gardener subscription box because I had gone through a time of not taking care of myself and dealing with the stress that it put onto my body. I was ill, I was tapped out, and I felt like I couldn't possibly pour any more out of my empty cup. So I created the Pampered Gardener subscription box for women like me who want wanted to get back to what they enjoy, but also wanted to love themselves. So we've put together this collection of gardening and self-care products that are geared towards women who love to garden. You'll get things such as gloves, lotion, bags, hats, sunscreen, mosquito repellent, things that you can actually use, but also things that you'll enjoy. And don't worry, there will still be plenty of gardening tools, seeds. We've created a subscription box like no other by Gardeners for Gardeners order your own box today um so i will say um ordering groceries saves me probably like four hours a week is what i figured because and not to mention like actually the the groceries budget that it saves me but um just not having to go into town drag kids through the store run up and down aisles because i just remembered something that i forgot Mm -hmm. uh you know um, and not to mention taking my kids into the store and then them nagging me for every little thing that they want to buy. Right. Or impulse buying, even though you menu planned and you made a list and you're trying to stick to it, you see something and you think, oh, it, and it could be something that you legitimately need, but at the same time, it's probably not something it's, you know, it's not pressing. It's just half the time. It's like, <clears throat> oh, look, cookies are on sale and Ooh, I'm really craving Publix buttercream icing. I better buy some cupcakes. And tr- trust me, the stuff is addictive. So, Don't so do you just buy junk food <laughs> if you go to the grocery store? Not necessarily. That's my husband. My like, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to forbade him from going to the store if he keeps coming home with more junk cereal. But um, see, I'll send my husband like, hey, honey, pick up a gallon of milk on your way home because it's on his way home. And then he's like, well, I didn't want to just spend two dollars. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's that's pretty much how it ends up. Stop yeah. by and get milk. Comes home with milk, granola bars, <laughs> chips, cereal, mm-hmm. some like, other random thing we, we don't need. Milk. Yeah, but I didn't want to spend two dollars, and I'm like, why? <laughs> because now our grocery budget went from we're doing okay to ha ha. <laughs> right. We have no money. <laughs> well, and that's one thing is um, it's it's kind of insane. So. Kroger, Kroger came to Florida 
they do not have brick and mortar stores. They have a distribution center that uses robots to pull the orders. And then everything's loaded onto trucks. It goes to different points throughout Florida. And then the delivery drivers pick it up from those points and do their delivery routes. But that saves them a ton of overhead since they're not having to actually operate brick and mortar stores and they're not having to pay as many employees. Right. <clears throat> so Kroger groceries delivered are cheaper than Publix groceries in store by like half. And but so Kroger own Publix? No, no, no. Two they don't? totally no, two totally separate okay. brands. Well, because like they we used to have Scott's here and it was Kroger's. I don't know if we have any more left. And then like when I lived in Colorado, King Supers is owned by Kroger. Oh, okay. No, here Kroger is or it was years ago. Or, or I mean Publix is a Florida based <clears throat> grocery chain. And um like it's I think it's still family owned. Okay. Um and it's one of those things where Kroger never wanted to come to Florida and directly compete with Publix because they know like when it comes to the brick and mortar, they, they, they literally have the same target markets. So they're really not like, it's just, it's just too competitive because there's too much brand loyalty there. But when it comes to grocery delivery, our only other options are like shipped and Instacart. And they tack on so much in fees that just the prices are astronomical. So, and I mean, I was like, I was delivering for shipped and Instacart for a while until gas prices got ridiculous. <laughs> um, and like, it was just our, our, our pay as a delivery driver was crap. Like the only way you could really make money is if you got a good tip. So, which is why when gas prices skyrocketed, it wasn't worth doing it anymore. Right. Um, but yeah. So in terms of ordering groceries, um, one, like since I'm going with the Kroger, going through Kroger delivery to get my groceries, I'm getting twice as much for half the price as shopping at Publix anyway. But then also like, yeah, I'm literally only getting what is on my list because I'm doing I'm doing my meal planning and cook list. It automatically generates my grocery list, which then I can upload to the Kroger app. Like it actually syncs with Kroger and sends my list to Kroger. And then I do the whole checkout and there's like no thought process involved. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I order my groceries. I do pick up. We don't do delivery, <clears throat> but it still saves me a ton of time. And a yeah. ton of money most of the time, except when they forget to load a bag and I have to drive all the way back to town. Oh, because, that stinks. Yeah, that was happening last time. But they gave me a $10 gift card, so. Well, that's good. I don't think I've had that happen. Mm -hmm. I will do um, curbside pickup for Walmart and Target. I don't shop at Walmart. Well, like, there's just... <laughs> I try not to. But there are, like, a few <clears throat> things that are just cheaper at Walmart or I can't get in bulk anywhere else kind of thing. Yeah, sadly, not I will pay extra to not shop at Walmart. I refuse to pay much <laughs> <laughs> Walmart. Um, so anyway, for for those things, I just I hate walking into the store because the, it's just there's just so much walking. Like the store is just too big. It takes too much effort for me. Like, and everything I want is always at the back of the store. Well, that's how Meyer is, but yeah. Well, and we don't have Meyer here. Yeah, I know. So but you did in Ohio. Yeah, I did in Ohio. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, if and and I have actually avoided buying stuff at Walmart because, um, it was going to take them too long to fill my order for when I was going to be passing by the store. Like, <laughs> it's yeah. Anyway, it's sad. Um. <clears throat> And then Target, I will do their curbside pickup because if I go into Target, I will spend more money than I should have. Stick to the perimeter. <clears throat> if you're going grocery shopping, have. this also helps you buy um, real actual food and not junk food if you just stick to the perimeter of the store because all grocery stores are laid out basically the same. So you have your produce section, which is on the perimeter, your meat section, which is on the perimeter, your dairy section is on the perimeter and really the most of the middle aisles you really shouldn't need. I mean, obviously most of us are still buying canned goods. A lot of us still eat grains, but 
if you stick to the middle part or not the middle, if you stick out of the middle part and stay in the perimeter, you're not buying cookies and buttercream icing. Uh, no, because the bakery is on the perimeter. Actually, the bakery is on the way to the produce section. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, but what I was going to say is, uh, if, if you are going to go in the aisles, um, <clears throat> read labels and try to pick the products that have the fewest number of ingredients. Um, ideally you want to go for like single ingredient <laughs> ingredients. Does that make sense? Single ingredient ingredients. Okay. How about single ingredient products? That works. Like canned um, goods, for instance, you know, like buying a can of black bean. Black? Right. <laughs> I can't talk either. Black beans. <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, take peanut butter, for example. Um, you've got a lot of peanut butter that ends up having a lot of sweeteners added to it. But then if you look at the natural peanut butter, like it's literally just peanuts, salt, and maybe like an emulsifier or something like that. Um, the fewer the ingredients, the healthier it's going to be for you. But also, uh, well, I would say in general, it's going to end up costing you less. Um, I realize a lot of the box, well, because yes, a lot of the box stuff is cheap, but it's because they're using the cheapest ingredients possible. And there's a lot of preservatives and fillers and a lot of other additional crap in there. Um, Sometimes so, quite literally. Quite literally. And so in a lot of a lot of salt. A lot of salt. Um but when you're when you're getting those single ingredient products, you're really just, I mean it's it's about the same in terms of cost, but you're getting a much higher quality product. Um but I mean like I will say, okay, so take macaroni and cheese for instance. No, no. Um, I find it's a lot cheaper for me to go and get a big thing of shredded cheese and a pound of macaroni noodles and then you know I, I already I have the milk and butter anyway and the flour but I can I mean I can pretty much make like a crock pot full of macaroni and cheese for the same price as a tiny little like eight ounce box of the pre-made stuff or you know like the the stuff with the powder mix and mine tastes a whole lot better i would use like um refried beans i think is a good example because especially if you're using canned beans or you have you know dried beans that you can at home so it's mm -hmm. super quick you just take the pinto beans and add some garlic and throw it in an instant pot for a couple minutes and then voila you have refried beans as opposed to the hydrogenated i can't pronounce it stuff that's in a can of refried beans yeah so if you, um, if you look at it that way and you start taking those single ingredient things, it's not going to cost you any more to, you know, like add a clove of garlic and a little bit of seasoning to a can of pinto beans. And you're going to end up with the same amount of food right. as if you grab that can of refried beans that cost $3 a can, as opposed to the dollar a can for the pinto beans. Yeah. And you can like, you can season it a lot better than like the And the way that you want it as opposed to. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes back to the bulk buying thing is you know if you get a lot of the dried beans and then um like can the pinto beans so that then all you really have to do is puree them and maybe add some additional seasonings right then it's a lot more convenient the, um for me i i end up having to store all my dried beans in the freezer just to try to deter like pantry moths and things like that um and weevils and so for me, like being able to can them ahead of time. One, th they're already soaked. They're already ready to go. They're already, right. they're already cooked. Um, but then also I'm not having to worry about bugs getting into the beans, the beans going bad, anything like that. Right. And I would suggest, you know, like if you are buying um, like flour or sugar or whatever in bulk, um, putting it in the freezer at least for a couple of days to kill any of those, you know, the minimum is like three days to make sure you kill right. all of the um, eggs and then put, make sure you're putting it in a gamma seal bucket. Don't just put it in any old thing. Yeah. Or you're um, just going to waste money because you're going to end up with stuff in your food that. You know, right. Like yeah. Cause like we use hard plastic containers, but when I've gotten the pantry moths, um, 
I don't think they ever made it all the way into the flower, but they would get into the, like the, the larva um, would get into the rings around the lid. And it was just, I mean, I end up having to take the whole thing apart and scrub it clean. And it was just, it was gross. Um, yeah. I've got every, everything goes into the freezer and then into Mason jars. Now, if it's going in the cupboard, um, we freeze it for a few days and then put um, bulk amounts in Gamma Seal free yeah. break buckets. And then have you ever put bay leaves in your flower? No. That was actually something I grew up with. The The smell from the bay leaves um, will deter pests from your flower. Does it permeate your flower? I never noticed an issue with it. Just, you know, make sure you don't scoop out the bay leaf when you're <laughs> scooping out flower. There is that. Um. But one thing I'll say is like flour will go rancid over time. And so you need to make sure you're, if you're storing a large quantity, make sure it's enough that you can, that you are cycling through on a regular basis. All right. So otherwise you're just going to end up with a lot of food waste. I think you should do that with anything. I put making food from scratch because we kind of already talked about that, but. Oh yeah. We were kind of talking about it. Um, I mean, yeah, to me, the more you can kind of cut out the middleman, the more you end up saving over time. Well, it's um, better for you. Like, and it's even better if, for you. If, even if you're eating grains, you know, that's debatable. Lots of, you know, lots of people say that you shouldn't eat grains at all. Other people say it's fine, especially if you're eating it homemade or whatever. Um, but a homemade loaf of bread is a lot better for you than something from the store because you, yeah. you don't have all those preservatives and other junk that you can't pronounce in it. And it's, added sugar you know, and added salt. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and um, you get to control those things. Right. You know, like and how much it sugar will, you're putting in it. You know, it will go st stale faster. Although you do have to kind of ask yourself, um, why is your bread lasting more than a week without going stale or moldy? Um, well, and you can't freeze it. Like, you know, it's not something yeah. that you have to have out fresh all the time, especially... Um, like in the summer, I know somebody in my group was talking about how it was too hot to bake bread, but if you kind of plan ahead or get an oven that you could put outside, like a little, mm -hmm. you know, like countertop oven, our countertop oven will bake a whole loaf of bread <clears throat> or a bread machine, I guess. But um, then you're not heating up your house and you can think ahead of time and freeze several loaves at once. So you're not having to, you know, like we don't bake, we don't bake bread weekly anymore anyways, but um I wouldn't do it in the summer. Like I would bake several loaves at one time and then put several of them in the freezer and keep the other one out fresh. Yeah. Well, and the other thing you can do is if you don't want to be baking in the heat of the day is mix it the night before. Um, let it proof in the refrigerator overnight. Cause it's going to, it's going to rise slower. And then you just take it out, do that final proof the next morning. It's actually going to develop better flavor that way. Um, cause the, the yeast has had more time to, to create the flavor in the dough, but, right. um, it will come to room temperature and finish rising that morning. You can bake it that morning before it's gotten hot out. I, I do. I definitely think that baking your own bread and making pasta, um, ends up saving you money. I guess pasta could be a toss up, but I mean, honestly, you can, it's so easy to make pasta noodles and so cheap. I mean, it's literally yeah. just like flour salt and an egg and you like, can dry those like you don't have to keep yeah. them like, um, because that's how you buy them. them in the store right yeah yeah you can freeze your noodles or your pasta whatever you want to call it so repurposing leftovers uh-huh i guess we did kind of hit on this already but yeah i'm terrible at it to be quite honest so um, my my kids are really into cooking shows so there is there is actually a cooking show now i don't it might be on netflix um, where they are given leftovers and they have to create a whole new meal with I've leftovers. seen that. I saw that on TV like yeah, a while, it's really, long, it's, while ago. It's interesting. Um, I don't go to that extent. I know some people are really weird about leftovers, and so it needs to look like something totally different or else they won't eat it. We just eat leftovers. Like, we, we like, don't, yeah. I, we I don't was, repurpose it usually. We just, you know, like I have some of that chicken and broccoli in there and I'll just, you know, we ate it for lunch. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's what we will usually just reheat stuff. I mean, I was like leftovers were a way of life growing up. So it just is, you know, it just is what it is. Um, but for other people, like they want to turn it into something different. So like I was saying, like if you're doing the roast chicken and then turn around and turn it into, um, you know, chicken salad or something like that. Um, I found that turning 
I mean, I can take just about any meat and turn it into taco meat. Um, and it works really well. Uh, the other thing that we will do is we will take meat and put it on top of baked potato. All right. We're going to move on to the next one or last one here. Yep. All right. Ah. Growing your own. Um, so this we will do a whole. would not be complete. Without... Yes. Um, we will do a whole other episode on when it, like when it comes to raising livestock, um, because that can very quickly turn into more expensive. Uh, but in terms of like growing, like with vegetables and fruits and things like that, uh, the the more perennials you can put in, like perennial fruit trees and bushes and things like that. I mean, that is really just going to be a renewing set renewable source of food um that is going to require very little input from you year after year um and you know like things like asparagus a lot of people don't realize that garlic can be a perennial which amuses me but anyway garlic <laughs> is a perennial or it can be well because yeah. most of us grow it as annuals so i think i think a lot of people just don't realize that you can actually just plant garlic and just leave it right and it'll, in a it'll couple of years keep you will have a great bulbs. big yep yeah yeah. Um, hey, well, if you're in a warm climate, sweet potatoes are a perennial. <laughs> they just keep right. coming back and coming back. Um, I I only cal calendula is definitely a oh, yeah, it perennial. <laughs> <laughs> if you like an edible flower or a tea or makes your own salves, um, yeah, uh, I only intentionally planted sweet potatoes once, and it just keeps coming back. I only intentionally planted calendula once. <laughs> it just keeps coming back. Same with borage. It's all over my garden. I refuse to let anybody pick it. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, like pull the whole plant up. I'm like, no, leave it alone. This Trevor's like, is that a weed? I'm like, nope. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not today. Oh, my southern peas. I made the mistake uh, because, like, you're supposed to kind of let them dry on the vine before you harvest them because you're harvesting the, the dry, the hard bean. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't harvest them fast enough one year. And so once they are completely dry, the seed pods will like burst open and spill beans all over your yard. And now I have yeah. years later, bean seedlings <laughs> everywhere. I know we've, we've even like had um, like volunteer tomato plants where we had like a crushed tomato that, you know, the seed was everywhere and we ended up with a couple plants out of it. Squash. I mean, there are ways to, Oh yeah. It might be haphazard and you might not know what's what until it starts to grow, but you know, you can yeah, I had... totally just have a garden full of Lord knows what. <laughs> <laughs> I had a seminal Without pumpkin any input. vine. Yeah. I had a seminal pumpkin vine that lasted <clears throat> three years. Um, because we didn't get a hard freeze over the winter. And so it just kept producing. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, and what would happen is it would kind of like die back in the winter because it does not like cold temperatures. But just enough of it would still be alive that it would, once it started heating up in the spring, it would start spreading again. And since it was already established, um, it would start with female blooms. Because typically a squash plant will start with male blooms and then start producing <laughs> female blooms like a few weeks later. Just, just put right. stuff in the ground. Like it, I mean, it can be in your flower beds. It can be um, along your fence line. Yeah. I think people, you know, like obviously you can, you know, have a big fancy garden and it may or may not produce better, but you really don't have to have all this fancy stuff. You just need some dirt and water and a seed. I mean, right. I mean, yes, it might not everything... be you know, like the most productive thing, but yeah. Like ha I mean, having everything in like a centralized location certainly makes it more convenient to care for and water and everything. Um, but I mean, really just plant where you have sun, get as much stuff into the ground as you can companion plant. Like I've, um, all of my beds are mixed with something else. So like I have one bed that is tomatoes, peppers, basil, and leeks. Um, the cucumber bed, I think I'm adding more leeks to it. And I don't know what else I'm putting in there yet. Um, eggplant bed has swiss chard planted with it um and zucchini, rotate your beds well yes um zucchini oh, has yeah. like zinnias and other flowers planted with it so yeah you can mix things up um but uh, yeah i've got eat. well right yeah grow stuff that you actually want to eat and i mean like we've 
I can grow tons of greens and lettuce and all that's not necessarily in the summer, but, um, you know, they grow really easily, but my family doesn't eat them and quickly. Right. Uh, but yeah, I've got a bunch of seedlings that I'm just going to start planting wherever. It's our rainy season. And so most stuff is getting rain every day anyway. Um, but I'm just going to start planting it everywhere just to get it in the ground. If I have to go out there and hand water with a hose, that's what I'll do. But once that's stuff gets I'm established, right we gotta get our drip back in. Yeah. Once stuff gets established, it doesn't need water as often. So unless it's a thousand degrees. Even then, I mean, like those those squash that I put in the ground are getting a lot less water than my raised beds. But because they are directly in the ground and they're not raised up, they're um, they're doing a lot better. Right. The raised beds are drying out faster. We're gonna put our drip in this weekend again because um, I'm not gonna be able to go water it, and I can't trust my kids to water it. Oh, I have a picture to send you later. I meant to ask you earlier about something. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm actually going to get a couple new irrigation, drip irrigation systems. Um, but we've got like the PVC on the beds that works pretty well, but I, I need to get back to putting timers on it so that I, you know, it's just one less thing for me to. Yeah, have to we have, we have that. timers and we had everything all set up and then now I've got to get it reset up. We bought right. new, we bought new soaker hoses. Mm, yeah. And we've those got tend fittings. to go bad. Well, we have fittings to put on the soaker hoses so we can move them about in the thing where they need to be and put tees and okay. elbows and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So it's just a matter of going out there and doing it in Mama, the next week. <laughs> Time's ticking, but at least your foot will feel better eventually. I hope so. Honestly, the world's a little bit scary right now um, just because we're struggling to survive. But Some of us are. Yeah, I mean, we're we're just we're struggling so much to to buy the essentials, to pay for the essentials. I mean, really, when it comes to like wants versus needs, you know, food is a fundamental need, right? Um, and so, hopefully, you know, the these are certainly the strategies that we use to save money in our own kitchens. So, hopefully, they can help you. Hopefully, and hopefully, you know, like inflation slows down a little bit so that um, they're still applicable. Because <laughs> when you're paying well, double for five yeah. people, that's a significant amount of uh, paycheck there. They're, and, they're uh, talking about yeah. us going into a stagflation, which we haven't had since the 70s, where the we go into a recession, but, you know, costs stay high mm -hmm. and inflation stays high. And it's going to take time for that to come down. Right now, I'm just trying to get us, like, living under our means as much as possible and setting, you know, money and food and stuff aside. Right. That's another thing. I don't know. If, have we talked about that? About, um, like, when you go to the store, you know, like, including your budget, like, grabbing a couple extra cans of beans or whatever it may be. So you can, and of course, you have to rotate your stock. But if you keep it in your budget, then you'll have a little bit of extra. Mm -hmm. yeah so I could, that, yeah we should have yeah and i mean especially if you can catch stuff on sale uh right the only thing i will say is so watch prices and pay attention to what your is your buy price because i know um i will pay attention to like i don't know I, i'll use Publix as an example but i'm sure all the grocery stores do this like the week before they are going to do a buy one, get one free deal on it, they raise the price. And then the next week it is buy one, get one free. But once you actually figure out the price that you're paying, per you're, item, buy you're buying for both of them. Yeah. You're paying close to what it was normally. Right. So, you know, sales will be tailored to make it look like a good deal, but make sure you know your buy price and, and your size and your size. Um, and only only buy when it's your buy price. Now I realize that's difficult to do when prices keep going up, but um, I think it's what is it? Sales are usually on like a six week rotation, mm -hmm. and so um, you can usually find the best deal on that six week rotation. And a lot of times this is a combination of stacking like coupons with sales and just buying enough for those six weeks 
plus a couple weeks. Like maybe actually getting eight weeks worth, even though you're buying it every six weeks. So then you've got right. Extra. Please, by all means, email us, message us on, on social media, and let us know. Um, you know, if you have any other strategies that you're using to help save money in the kitchen. And please make sure that you um, subscribe to our podcast and leave a review and a rating so that we can help other moms. Um, like I said, we we do have some podcasts coming up talking about other ways that we can save money and kind of recession-proof our homesteads. Uh, so you'll want to stay tuned for that. And we'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Grounded in Simplicity podcast. If we were able to help you in any way, please share this episode with a friend and also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also join us over on Patreon at Grounded in Simplicity and help to support this podcast as well as become a patron and get a behind-the-scenes look at the creation of our podcast and even have some input on future episodes.